Our first scripture reading comes from the Gospel of Luke. The 8th chapter, verses 1 through 3, talk about the beginning of Jesus' ministry and especially how he called certain women and a woman named Mary to follow him. Hear now God's word to us. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their resources. Then we turn to the Gospel of John as we hear his version of the Easter story in chapter 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So throughout Lent in these past few weeks, we've had a sermon series called Faces at the Cross, where we've focused on the influential people of the last week of Jesus' life. This morning, the face that we peer into is that of Mary Magdalene. We know quite a bit about Mary. We know she's from Magdala, which is a city that is on the western side of the Sea of Galilee. We know from Luke's scripture that we read this morning 
that she had seven demons cast out of her by Jesus himself. And that's when she became a follower. It said that she and several other women followed Jesus for the next three years or so. You see, when we read scripture, sometimes it's, it's easy to forget about the other people that followed. Yes, there were the 12 disciples, but this scripture reminds us there were several women and also some other men who were followers of Jesus also. So in a very real way, Mary and the other women were just as much disciples as the 12 names that we have. They still heard Jesus teach. They experienced his miracles. They were in his presence for almost three years. They were just as much shaped and molded and influenced as any of the other disciples. And scripture says that these women provided for Jesus and those 12 disciples out of their resources. So these were the women who would, you know, gather the food and cook for these guys and clean their clothes and, you know, right, women? You know what we do for these men. And that's what Mary and, and her other sisters in Christ did, provided for these guys out of their resources. So Mary is listed first. Whenever a list of women are mentioned as far as Jesus' followers, she's the one mentioned first, kind of like Peter, when the male disciples are mentioned. So she, she has a, a place of prestige or of importance as a follower of Jesus. All the Gospels record Mary as being there at the foot of the cross. They record her as being there on that Easter sunrise morning to see the empty tomb. They record her as being the first person to experience Christ risen. And Mary is the first evangelist to go and tell others the good news that Jesus is alive. Now in John's version of the story, Mary is the only one to go to the tomb that morning. She wakes up well before dawn. She travels in the dark toward the tomb because you see the appropriate burial rites and rituals had not yet been completed. And so she took it upon herself to finish the task that had been started Friday afternoon. You may recall that Jesus died around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the Sabbath began at sundown around 6. So there were only three hours for Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus in John's Gospel to ask Pilate for the body, to get him down from the cross, to wrap him with the appropriate spices and ointments, and then lay him in the tomb before sundown when no work could be done. They finished just in time, but... They weren't able to complete all the burial rites and rituals. And so Mary got up early in the morning to take on that task. Now imagine, here she is. She is going to a tomb to ask a guard to roll away this huge boulder so that she could go inside this cave, unwrap the linens of someone who had been dead for 36 hours so that she could rub the spices and ointments and say the prayers, perform the traditions of her people. In many ways, it, it was a gruesome task. And yet, out of her love and devotion for Jesus, she was willing to do it. So she gets there at the tomb, but she didn't have to ask the guard to roll away the stone because it was, it was already to the side. And I'm sure she thought how strange that was, but hey, maybe Joanna or Susanna or Mary the mother or James or somebody else had gotten there before her and had had the guard move that stone earlier. But when she peered into the tomb, her heart skipped a beat. 
not only was there no one there, there was no body there. There was nothing except the, the, the clothes, the linens that had wrapped Jesus' body. And the only logical explanation is that somebody stole the body of Jesus. Her first reaction was horror. The empty tomb at first was not good news. Because notice something in John's gospel, there's no angels or hallelujah chorus or trumpets or trombones or french horns or strings or timpani or anything else but there's no dazzling white clothes there's there's nothing miraculous at that tomb except grief and confusion and so this distraught woman goes running to find the disciples and she runs into peter and the other disciple and tells them breathlessly panting they've they've taken away my lord and, and and i don't know where they've laid him and peter and the other disciple go racing back to the tomb to, to to see is this real could it be and when they get there they verify this story the body is gone and they leave confused upset now there are three witnesses to this empty tomb, but there's still no angels. There's still no understanding about what is going on. Because at first, the empty tomb is not good news. Well, the disciples go back home, the two men. Maybe they go to tell others what has happened. Maybe to brainstorm, who would have done such an awful thing, the last great insult to an innocent man? Or they, maybe they just go back to grieve a second time for the missing body. But notice that Mary stays. Mary stays right there at the tomb, mirroring her action at the cross. No matter how painful, no matter how heartbreaking, she was going to remain in that place and live in that moment. One of the lowest moments of her life. Because not only was Jesus dead, now his body was missing. And she had nothing now. Everything that had made sense to her had been taken, had been stolen. And if we pause the story right there, we could probably think of a time in our lives when we've walked in Mary's shoes. Times when we were at our lowest. Times when life didn't make sense and there was chaos in our midst and we're crying and we're, we're right there on our knees at an empty tomb confused and upset and asking questions about why is this happening and what is next and what do I do now in the midst of that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness trying to make sense of it all and yet all you have is grief and loss and pain Many of us have been in Mary's shoes. And we know what that feels like, that gut-wrenching, heartbreaking feeling. Remember that time because that's where Mary was. But she stayed there. She didn't run away from that pain and the grief. She stayed right there. And thank goodness she did. Because she peered one more time into that tomb but this time there were two angels who were there and they simply asked her one question woman why are you weeping and she could have answered a whole lot of different ideas she could have said I'm weeping because they nailed his body to the cross and laid him in a tomb. I'm weeping because everything that ever made sense in my life is gone. I'm weeping because he's dead. But instead she said, 
I'm weeping because they've taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they've laid him. It was bad enough that he was dead, but now he's missing, completely gone, and she has no idea where he is. And notice the angels, again, don't come with any comforting words. They don't say, do not be afraid. They do not say, he is risen. Come see the place where he lay. In John's version, the angels don't provide any comfort at all because the conversation's interrupted. Maybe she hears a twig snap behind her or a footstep. Or maybe she just feels the presence of something else, but something distracts her from looking at the angels, and and she turns around. But she's got tears streaming down her face, and, and her nose is running, and her eyes are red and swollen from days and days of crying and grief. And through the blur of her tears, she makes out a man that's in front of her. Now we know he's Jesus. We know that that what is standing in front of her is the greatest miracle of all. And yet all she sees through that pain and grief and tears is a common, everyday gardener. Because you see, when Jesus comes to us, Jesus doesn't always come with neon signs that saying, I am risen, or white sparkling robes, or fanfare, or hallelujahs, or angels. Sometimes Jesus comes to us in the grief of our lives as a common everyday gardener. And Mary, figuring that, well, he's the only one here. Maybe maybe someone bribed him to, to not say anything. Or maybe he knows where the body is. Or maybe he himself took it. Maybe he's responsible. Ironic. And so she says, sir, if, if you know where the body is, if you know where they laid him, please tell me. I will go get him and take him back. She's trying to make sense, trying to make normalcy out of a messy, chaotic situation. But then Jesus calls Mary by name. Mary. Mary. And she knows. She knows there's no gardener. She knows there's no no missing body. But instead, there is a risen Christ. And I don't know why it is why Jesus has to call our names to get our attention sometimes. But that's the only way that we can experience resurrection. That is the only way that we know that Jesus is alive, that his presence is real in our lives is when he calls our name at the lowest point. And we realize, we recognize that he is with us. Because resurrection is not something you can explain. It's something you've got to experience. If you could explain it, Jesus may as well have set Mary down and said, Mary, I believe you're operating on a false hermeneutic here, so let's sit down and go over the uh, theology of atonement so that you can understand why the scripture was fulfilled. Mary needed to see him, to hear him, call her name, and experience him for herself. You can't explain resurrection. It addresses you, and it calls you out. And that's all he had to say. Because then she knew the truth. And what is her response when she sees Jesus and knows that he's real and knows that he's right there in front of her? She says that word, Rabboni. Now, Scripture tells us that it means teacher. Yeah, but so does rabbi. Why didn't she say rabbi? Rabboni means my rabbi, my teacher, my master. When she said Rabboni, it means this is the same Jesus I've known for the last three years. This is the same Jesus that healed me from those seven demons. This is the same Jesus that I know and who knows me. And we have that intimate relationship. Rabboni means 
It's a friend. It's someone we know well. My teacher, my master, my Lord. Because you see, when Jesus comes to you through the sobbing and through the tears and through the heartache and calls your name, you start to realize that maybe God has not abandoned me in this situation after all. Maybe, maybe Jesus is right there with me and I just didn't see him at first through my tears and grief. Maybe. Maybe Jesus is helping me, giving me what I need to get through each and every day, step by step. My Jesus, my master, my Lord. It goes from a knowledge of Jesus to an experience of Jesus, and that makes all the difference in our lives. Because it's often in those heartbreaking times when we truly know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is with us. That's where we see Jesus in our midst. And our first response is, is to say, my Lord, my God, my Jesus. Now, Scripture doesn't record what happens next, but it's pretty easy to guess that she just wanted to, to give him a big hug, embrace him. You know, it's, um, she hadn't seen him. She didn't know, didn't know where he was, and he's dead, and all of a sudden he's in front of her, and she just wants to grab hold of him and hold on to him. I mean, after all, he was missing for so long. Maybe she just wants to know, is this real? Maybe if I touch him, I'll know for sure. I'll know this is not some kind of hallucination. And maybe if I grab onto him and hold him and never let him go, then he'll never leave me. He'll be with me forever. But it's interesting what Jesus told her. Our translation says that Jesus told her, don't hold on to me. But, but really the translation means don't cling to me. Don't, don't grab me. Don't hinder me. Don't, don't put me in a box or don't hold me so tight that you're trying to own me or control me. He said, no, no, don't hold on to me. Because you see, Jesus is not a possession, not something we can hold on to and have and keep just for ourselves. In fact, it's supposed to be the other way around. Jesus holds on to us. Jesus owns us. Jesus controls us, possesses us as, as a master, as servant, as a friend, as a savior. The emphasis shifts sometimes from my Lord to my Lord, mine, all mine. And sometimes we can move into that dangerous territory of trying to control Jesus and use him as a, a tool or a weapon, as a pawn for our own wants and our own biases, our own needs. But it's always been meant to be the other way around. We don't hold on to him or cling to him. We surrender to him. And instead of us trying to figure out what, what church and Christians and, and God are supposed to be and do and try to mold that, instead we surrender ourselves to be molded by God. That's what the Christian journey is all about. And then when we understand that, then we go out and tell others we have seen the Lord because we have had that personal encounter with the living Christ. And that is our message this morning. We do not just have a bunch of facts about something that happened 2,000 years ago. We don't just have a book that tells us some event of the past. We have a living, personal testimony about how Jesus has made a difference to us, has shown up in some of the heartbreaking times of our lives, made himself real, and how that has made all the difference. And then we're told to go out and tell other people, we have seen the Lord. Go and announce that message to the world. Because even through our tears, even through the heartbreak, we know that Jesus is alive. 
Not just alive somewhere, but alive here and now in our lives, right beside us, whether we recognize him or not. Jesus is not a possession we cling to and hold on to and own. Jesus is the living Lord of our lives that we surrender to and who holds on to us and will never let go. Because, my friends, Easter is not just a day. Easter is a way of life, living in a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus and sharing that with the world and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that he will never let us go.